In the 90s, internet changed our societies profoundly. People all over the world became connected. Frontiers opened up. Then in the early 2000s, our communications became mobile. And just like the internet, mobile phones changed our lives significantly. We rely on our phones for almost everything. Scheduling our days, checking the news, connecting to social media, listening to music, Sometimes we even use our phones to make a phone call. Running out of battery has become a widespread concern. Un seul objet vous manque, et le monde est dépeuplé. Mobile phones impacted our personal lives, but also at a global scale. Thanks to our mobile activity, we're leaving digital traces behind us. Traces that are collected by telecom operators. These traces have opened up a new way of analyzing how we move and how we create social ties. We have become able to study entire populations simultaneously through a new, pervasive source of data. Today, I want to show you how important telecom data is for developing countries in particular. Last year, the United Nations have set an ambition They aim to achieve a series of global goals, such as putting an end to extreme poverty or achieving global health, by 2030. This is just 15 years from now. Achieving these goals is a very ambitious objective, and to reach them, we will need to improve the way we currently do development work. If you wonder what I mean by development work, it's anything that can help local populations to improve their quality of life such as better road infrastructures, access to water or internet, or financially supporting the poorest populations in the country. While their jobs can be very diverse, development workers and policymakers all rely on one key resource to function efficiently, information. Let me show you two examples to illustrate this. Like for many developing countries, Malaria is endemic in parts of Zambia. It is needless to say how much malaria cripples all aspects of life. It's affecting people's health and life expectancy. But it's also affecting the global economy of the country and its development. This is why Zambia has a malaria control center, which is responsible for monitoring the evolution of the disease and planning the response at the level of the country, such as distributing bed nets indoor spreading or destroying mosquito larva sites. The Malaria Control Center relies on two important pieces of information to function efficiently. Good reporting of new cases when they occur and a sound understanding of how those cases have occurred to localize its root causes and act at their source. Currently, The Malaria Control Center will get the information through a central reporting system where practitioners encode new cases when they treat them. They also encode other information, such as where the patients have traveled recently to understand where the disease is likely to be spread. This last piece of information is very important, as human mobility is the main reason why diseases spread geographically. However, The Malaria Control Center has currently two problems with their data. First, the data is often not of good quality. Patients might forget to name places they've traveled to because they don't seem important enough to be mentioned, such as a city where they transit for a night. Data is of low quality because city, na can, city names can be misspelled as data is entered manually. Finally, the precision is not very accurate. The second limitation is that this data is actually not very relevant for the development center, the control center. The patients might have spent a couple of hours in some places and weeks in others, which changes dramatically the risk of exposure, but is not visible in the data. First example. I'll show you now a very different example. 
to show you why information is so important across all facets of development, not only disease management. This example comes from Kampala, the capital city of Uganda. One of the key routes of achieving the productivity miracle in developing countries is well-mastered urbanization. And for Uganda, urbanization is the single largest opportunity in the coming decades. Kampala is growing fast. It's expected to triple in size in the next 35 years. What does Kampala need to achieve well-mastered urbanization? Roads, not are large enough to sustain the traffic of the city. Currently, Kampala is famous for its traffic jams. A one-hour drive to the airport can quickly grow to five hours. You believe Brussels has problems about congestion? Try Kampala. Systems for water, electricity and sewage that are dimensioned to the size of the growing population. A development plan to anticipate the future growth of the, of the city. Again, the city of Kampala will rely on information to master its growth. How many people are living in the neighborhoods of the city, and in particular in slums, where the poorest populations are living? What are the current traffic demands on the road infrastructure? How are these numbers expected to grow in the near future? But as for Zambia, we see the same problems emerging when collecting data about it. The crucial data about population and traffic are collected manually by sending people on the streets to count how many cars are passing by or estimate the density of a neighborhood. What these two examples show us are common limitations when working in developing countries, dealing with scarce information, often of poor quality, and not formatted to our needs. But are these limitations we have to deal with? Wouldn't there be a better way to systematically collect rich and exhaustive data to help development workers to be better in their jobs? This is where mobile phones come into the play. Telecom data can be used to provide rich data that can help development workers to change their jobs. If you wonder how, let me show you how telecom data can help Zambia's Malara de de Control Center. This is the southern province of Zambia. It's about three times the size of Belgium. The colors on the map indicate how many cases of malaria have been reported officially in each region. Here, the darker areas, which indicate most cases, are located in the southeast, next to the Lake Kariba. From this perspective, all places close to the lake seem equally important to, be, uh, intervention, to have interventions, right? Well, watch this. With access to mobility information in the country, we know how many people move between the different regions. We present this by a network. We represent the mobility corridors by links. Green links represent low mobility, so few people traveling between the regions. And red links represent high mobility, so many people. If we input this information into a mobility model, into an epidemiological, an epidemiological model, we can predict how many people uh, can predict how many cases of malaria can be transmitted to the rest of the country. So by adding mobility, we can change the importance of the regions by understanding how much they spread around them. Let's see how the picture changes for these two regions on the map when we add the information about mobility. As you can see, they have about the same uh, the, the, the same malaria incidents, and they are closed geographically. On each map, we see the blue area, which is the place that where malaria has been cured. And the rest of the map is colored to show the impact it has on other regions by reducing the risk of exposure to malaria. Clearly, there, has been, there is one region that has a much more broader impact because its central position on the network. Don't take me wrong, I'm not saying that other places should not get an intervention, but this place needs to receive special attention given its particular position. 
What a change for the malaria control center. Where before we relied on scarce information of poor quality, today we can understand how disease spreads across an entire country and localize its root causes thanks to the crucial information of human mobility. This mobility map has been built using telecom data. Every time we make a phone call or send a text message, our operator stores some metadata about our activity. The phone number we have contacted, the place we are located, the date, the time, but not the content of the conversations. It's as if we all had a little sensor in our pocket, collecting some piece of information about our daily activities. And these sensors are distributed across entire populations. Half of the population in the developing world owns a mobile phone. And what happens when we aggregate the information of these millions of sensors together? We can build mobility maps across entire countries. We can build revenue maps and localize where the poorest populations in the country are living. We can estimate population densities in cities and track the evolution of slums. We can map population migrations and predict food crises we can create relevant information for development workers and policymakers. Right now, many of you might wonder if I'm not asking local populations to trade their privacy for a better life. These mobile data logs represent very personal and private data. These are the phone numbers we have been calling to, the places we have been, how much we spend. But none of the solutions presented here require any personal information. They all have in common to exhibit common dynamics of entire populations, not of individuals. By law, mobile operators are required to collect this personal information for billing purposes and to protect the privacy of their users. Once these pieces of information are aggregated over entire geographical areas, they only represent average behaviors of entire populations, protecting the privacy of individuals in the crowd. At that time, everyone agrees, both technical experts and legislators, that this information is safe to be shared, as are census data, which are freely available in many countries. Over the last 10 years, Dozens of research groups have studied how to improve emergency response or development work with the help of telecom data. Studies have been conducted in Haiti, Rwanda, Nepal, Mexico, Pakistan, or Ivory Coast, to only name a few. But the next step, going from research to operational tools, are still missing. Large institutions, telecom operators, local regulators, Donors all agree on the need, but a common dynamic to move forward and unified regulations are still missing. And it is very difficult to make the first successful case. And we need everyone on board to make this happen. We need to convince regulators that a new legal framework is necessary to allow such analyses and protecting the privacy of users. We need to convince operators, sorry, need to understand that it is in their own interest to share their data for a better society, because a better society will guarantee them more and better customers tomorrow. We need strong bonds with local development workers to develop tools that are fully adapted to their needs. We need large institutions to oversee the system. And finally, we need donor funds to finance the costs of developing and implementing these solutions. Yet things are changing step by step, and stakeholders align in the effort. Three years ago, my colleagues and I realized we were in a unique position, close to operators in, de in developing countries and with strong analytical expertise. As we wanted to contribute to the system, we launched a project called Data for Good, with the objective to create operational tools for development workers with the help of telecom data. And the results are already visible. 
We signed partnerships with local authorities, such as the city of Kampala or Zambia's Malaya Control Center. We have signed a global agreement with one of Africa's largest telecom operators to share their data for Data for Good Actions. We are partnering with UN agencies on topics such as food security or national statistics. We are getting, fund, uh, we're getting financial support by the Belgian uh, Ministry of Development and by large donor funds to develop these tools. And last but not least, we are not the only one to believe that this is more than an utopia. Large telecom operators, UN agencies, researchers across the world, our initiative is not unique, and many others are also sharing how convinced they are about the concepts of telecom data for social good. In the 90s, internet. Early 2000s, mobile phones. Over the last few years, a new technological revolution has emerged where analytics are put at the service of humans for an ever more optimized and efficient society. Together, these technological revolutions give us today a unique opportunity. It is that tomorrow, with the help of telecom data, development workers fighting poverty or combating diseases will become as efficient as our businesses have become when it comes to selling us new products. And that day, achieving the global goals will be within the reach of our hands. Thank you.